Oh, wow. So good to see you this morning. Welcome to you if you're worshiping with us in the commons, and we're glad you're part of our services here on this campus. If you're worshiping with us in Millard, way to go. Last weekend, over 400 people at Millard. Amazing. Way to go, guys. And we've just been open for uh, three months now in Millard, and so it's going great. A lot of people have asked about it. If you live in the Millard area, 144th and Q, we have a, a site there as well. It's just kind of like here, except I'm not there most of the time. And so a lot of people like it. We're closing off today our message series on asking tough questions and trying to answer tough questions. We've looked for the last four weekends at some of the most difficult questions that get asked during the Easter season. Why did people hate Jesus so much? And why have you forsaken me? And why can't you stay awake? Um, you know, and for us today, this is the last one. We'll deal with it. Next weekend, we're kicking off a series called 4 by 4 uh, we're, if you got big Jeeps or trucks, we need you. Bring them here next weekend. We already got some, but we, um, we're going to look at f the uh, four four-letter words for four weekends in a row. So, right, four-letter words. You need to come find out. There's an S word and there's some other. Um, so just anyway, um, next weekend kicks off four by four. Uh, what we believe is going to take, it takes to uh, get us up on the journey and move us forward, all right? Uh, so today we're going to take a look at answering the question, why don't we have a cross on this building? That's the number one question we get in our membership class. Uh, not, you know, um, that, that's the biggest one. And, and so we're going to try our very best to answer that question. Uh, you know, we love, in the Christian community, we kind of have an infatuation with crosses, I guess. I don't even know what to say. I mean, there's 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 a church in uh, the United States that built a cross 190 feet high, 190 feet high. You can see it for 20 miles. It's in Groom, Texas. A thousand people stop there every day to look at the cross. 10 million people will drive by it every year. So it's pretty impressive. But somebody decided that that's not big enough. In Corpus Christi now... There's a church that wants to build one 210 feet high. It's to be the tallest cross in the Western Hemisphere. It will cost a million dollars. Amazing. But that's not the biggest one. In Madrid, Spain, there's a cross that rises 495 feet high. Just think about that. You must need some clearance from a government somehow, but that's amazing. So we like crosses. We're into that. Uh, there's a guy that's been hauling around a cross for 12. It's a 12-foot cross. He's been hauling it around uh, 12 hours a day since 1987. He's been all over the world carrying the cross. People wear a cross around their neck. They get a tattoo with the cross. We sing songs about the cross. It's a very important symbol in the Christian community. So why don't we have one? Are you guys some sort of cult or something? How does somebody even know we're a Christian church if we don't have a cross? So I'm going to do my very, in fact, we've had people actually leave our church because we don't have a cross. All right. Doesn't matter if I did their funeral or not. I mean, it's like, really? So why don't we have one? Well, our master plan does call for a cross on our campus. Someday we'll have one. It's going to be 510 feet high. <laughs> we are a little competitive here, so we're going to have the biggest honking cross we can get. It's allowed by the United States of America. And we're not anti-cross, and uh, we really aren't. And I'm going to do very, very best today to help us to think today, all right? And, try, and I'm, gonna very, I'm really going to try hard not to be sarcastic, but it is in my nature to be that way. So it'll might, it's like, just be, just be nice. All right. Now, on my recent trip to India, I learned some things about the Hindu religion. 80% of the country uh, is Hindu, and uh, it's one of the biggest countries in the world. In their Hindu religion, there's over 30,000 gods, that they have created. It's a very religious country. All over the country, every, uh, all over the countryside, there are little shrines and statues and Hindu temples that will date back centuries ago. 
We went to a Hindu temple that was built in the ninth century. It's a magnificent structure. One of the temples we went to, we were fortunate enough to go to one of their ceremonies, and I had never been to something like that. And at this temple, there was a lot of uh, shrines and, and idols, and, and we had a guide that did his very best to help us understand which, uh, what, what they all represented. And, um, uh, and this particular night, there was a ceremony that was going to be done to a, a, a god that was a fertility god. And so there was a uh, kind of a long, narrow passageway, which we were not allowed to step on because of the, of the flow of blessing from the God to the people who were there to offer sacrifices to the, to the, to the God. And there was a priest in the, in, the, in the room, and he had incense and was chanting, and there was loud music and, and uh, drums and chanting, and uh, it was just really impressive. Um, and, and then when it was over, the people came forward and to offer their sacrifices to this God. And because it was fertility God, the, there was a wedding party there, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they were dre- all dressed up as if they had just done the ceremony, but they wanted to be, have children, I guess, and, and uh, wanted to be there. Uh, so it, it was just fascinating to me. But it was also incredibly depressing. The, many of the gods that we had looked at were prosperity gods of some kind. And you think about that. These people live in extreme poverty, have been praying to that God for years and years and years, right? And it's not working. There's massive extreme poverty. So you just think, what in the world's going on here? Well, it's a hopeless kind of situation. And I could see why God in his wisdom would say this in Deuteronomy 5, you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in heaven or on earth or in the sea. Don't do it. It's in the top 10, right? It's in the big honking deals. Here's what I want our people, the people of faith and of God. Here's what I am demanding of all of you. When Moses went up to receive these 10 commandments, it did not take the folks very long to doubt if Moses was gonna return. He'd been up there for a little while and people began to panic and wonder if Moses died up on the mountain. Maybe a lion got him or maybe something happened to him, he fell and he's probably not coming back. So we need to take matters into our own hands and fashion some sort of God that would help us. Think about it. I mean, they go from the people, right? From worshiping Yahweh to within a few weeks they're saying give us some gold and silver and the people are like okay why and we're like we need a God okay that's true uh here you go and they gave tons of gold and silver and they melted all down and they fashioned for themselves a God that looked like a cow I don't know why they chose that maybe they're good at making cows I don't know Uh, but that was what they chose Moses comes down right with the Ten Commandments. And he was obviously messed up by that. He destroys the tablets. He's infuriated with them. God's furious with them. And Moses has to plead for 40 days and 40 nights that God would not wipe the people off the planet. He pleads with God, don't do it. I know, I know, I can't believe it, I know. Please, God, in his grace, doesn't wipe them off the planet. Now, we might not make a little God like that or have an idol or maybe some of that kind of stuff, but, but we create that in our minds. When we say something like this, well, my God is like this. I can't believe in a God like that. My God is more like a grandpa He loves me, takes care of me, knows that boys are boys, girls will be girls. He doesn't care much what I do. He loves me. That's what a grandpa's supposed to do, right? So we were like a God that looks like grandpa, but with more money, (laughs) right? And energy. Help us out. It's so much easier to create a God than to conform to one. 
So in America, we don't really say hey, we got 30,000. We got way more than that because every individual can make up their own God however they feel. And, and if, you know, my, well, my God's cool with this. My God's cool with that. My God doesn't do this. And so we created it in our own mind. How convenient to create a God who will let us do what we want. Now, when I began to think about this, I was a little worried that we have allowed the cross to become a symbol or an idol. Think about this. Oftentimes, we take our cross, we put it around our neck, maybe get a tattoo, put it up on our, in our home. I'm not saying don't do this, but I'm just saying be really careful because oftentimes what we do with that is we treat that as if it's a good luck charm. Well, what do we do when we get up to bat? Get the cross out. Boom, as if now God's going to help me get a double, right? I kiss my lucky cross. It's my, I've always had this cross. Every time I wear this cross, good things happen to me. As if it's a lucky foot of some kind, which, by the way, is kind of, ask the rabbit if it's a lucky foot, right? I mean, <laughs> so sure it is lucky. Never, by the way, never name your rabbit lucky either. That's lucky's foot, Oh, no. And so sometimes we think, right, if I have this thing with me, it protects me, keeps me safe, as if now God, right, is with me. Kind of, kind of borderline idolatry, isn't it? If I do this, then he's going to help me out. I'm not saying that don't do that. I'm just saying be careful uh, about that, right? Be very, very careful. Well, how will people know that we're a church? Well, we put a big sign out there that says Stonebridge Christian Church. But this building is not the church. We have to get away from the fact we even say that it's a church building, right? And I get that. That's fine. But it's a place where we gather. But what happens in homes or in theaters or in schools or YMCAs or arenas or parks every single day is the church taking place. This building is a tool to help us accomplish our mission, which is to share Christ and build believers. But that happens every day. We come here on a Sunday or Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we, we recharge and refresh and we calibrate our lives. And so I think it's important for us to do that. Uh, but we don't leave the church here. How do people know that we're a church? by our big honking cross. I've been in a lot of church buildings recently that have really nice big crosses, but there's no people in them anymore. So someday maybe we'll have a cross because we might buy a church that already has one equipped, right? It's like, okay, we can do that. But it's not what's gonna make it. It really doesn't. How do people know that we're a Christian? Because we got a cross necklace? or have a tattoo, or because we wear a Christian t-shirt? No. So what do we do with the cross? Well, Jesus told us what to do with it. Here we go, Mark 8. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If anyone would come after me, Here's what's going to be required. If you want to be a Christian, you want to be a Christ follower, you're going to have to do this. And one of the things is, is following, right? It's, following. it's a big deal. Now, think about this. Uh, if, uh, it makes a huge difference who's asking. And what if you were invited to attend a meeting at the White House? There's an official envelope and everything. And you're going to be part of a meeting with the president in two weeks. And you think to yourself, is this a joke? I can't believe the president. And But you call your senator it's like, hey, I just got a, 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 an invite from President Trump. And, and uh, <laughs> I mean, no, no, President Clinton. I, oh, what, uh, I've got an invite from the president of the United States. Is this real? And he says, yeah, it's real. He wants you there. I'm like, oh, man. Now, you might think, well, I'm not going because I didn't vote for that guy. I didn't vote for her. I don't, I don't agree with it. But I'll tell you what. 
I'd go. I don't care who it is. It's the president of the United States of America, my country. And if he wants my help for whatever reason, right, I'll be there. I'm booking a flight to D.C. I'm going. Here's Jesus, the son of God, asking you, which it blows my mind, asking you and me to follow him. The son of God says, follow me. I go, if I agree with all the stuff you talk about, I don't know. No, we're like, whoa, the Son of God wants, wants me to follow him. Many of you have probably been on a short term mission trip or to a church camp and you've experienced some incredible things. On our short term mission trips, we've got hundreds of people that now have gone with us, uh, experienced different culture, different food, different languages, uh, tried their very best to communicate and struggled with coming to grips with extreme poverty, especially in light of how much stuff you have. You come back home all messed up and you couldn't believe how much fun you had during that time. It was as if time had stood still, right? Even though it was hard work and there was a lot of, you know, uncomfortable things going on, you got great relationships with people that you never had met for, before. And within a short period of time, with less, less than a week, you have great friends now at our church and have made a huge impact on the lives of people. And you think, I wish I could feel like that all the time. Remember when you went to church camp, you're in high school, and you, know, you, you just can't believe how great it was and excited you were to be in, you know, with all these people and people you didn't even know, but with it, by Thursday night, you were best friends forever. And it was just this incredible feeling of eternity. And you think, I wish it was like that the whole, and, and you had this empty feeling when you're coming home thinking, Uh, I got to go back to the same old things and stuff. What if that was possible? What if it was possible to live like that? John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. So the thief, Satan's purpose is to suck the life out of you. That's his purpose. He's going to kill your life. He's going to suck the joy out of your life constantly. That's what he's trying to do. My purpose, Jesus says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life, or we would even say an abundant life, a full life. The reason we loved that short-term trip was because we were expanding the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean that I have to quit my job and move to a foreign country? Not necessarily. But some of you have already indicated that that might be something that you would see yourself doing down the road. So you might as well start getting ready for that. But what does it look like to have an abundant life? Well, I think it has to do with bearing a, carrying a cross. We know from Easter that cross-bearing and cross-carrying is hard. It's been necessary. Jesus carried his own cross for a while, but he also needed help. Cross-bearing was about sacrifice, just like being on that mission trip. That trip, unlike most of the trips we take, right, in our lives, that trip was all about giving. It wasn't about getting. I got nothing out of that, right? It wasn't for me. It was for them. And what I discovered that when I take a trip like that, my life explodes. So many of you love those trips now that you will take, you're taking now vacation time, which you had typically taken to go somewhere else, now you go to Mexico every year to build a house. Because you get more out of life that way than an all-inclusive resort. Cross-bearing for Jesus was about sacrifice and it was about surrender. What did he say? Not my will, right? Not my will. It's all, cross-bearing is all about surrender. Am I submitting my will to God? It's amazing how surrender brings life. Jesus says, if you want life, you got to lose it. We're thinking, whoa, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. If I want life, I got to grab it for all it's worth. And I says, no, 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 you're going to have to lose your life. Submitting to carrying a cross is hard. No longer do I get a say. Um, sometimes I feel generous. Sometimes I don't. 
See, what I have now that I've surrendered is it's all God's money now. You know, this body is mine and I can do whatever I want. I no longer get to say that. I no longer get to choose that. Why? Because this body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. He now lives in me. We don't go to church to meet God. He comes with me every single day. He's with me all the time. There's no way for me to come to life without surrender. I offer obedience. I do what he says. I'm not in charge. John Ortberg writes this. There are many messages from the Bible that everybody likes. No matter how much you mess up, God still loves you. Everybody likes that one. You're so busy and exhausted, God wants you to be rested and refreshed. Everybody likes that. But there's some other messages that we don't like. You need to surrender. You are sinful and stubborn. You are self-centered and self-promoting. You need to bend the knee and submit your hearts and confess your sin. Pick up your cross. I can name at least one person who doesn't like to hear those things. Me. When we're submitting, we kneel, right? If you go before the king, you kneel, admitting in your life, and humbling your life, acknowledging that that's the king. He's your master. When a believer in any religion comes to pray to his God, he does what? He often kneels, acknowledging that he is in the presence of his master. When a man asks a woman to become his wife, he kneels, acknowledging that he is now in the presence of his master. (laughs) Thank you. If we are to pick up our cross and follow, we have to learn surrender. Jesus knew what it was like to surrender his life, right? In the 12-step program, where many people have found uh, sobriety and finally were be able to to, uh, address the issue that was tripping them up so much. Never in the 12-step program do they ask you to stop drinking. Think about that. They don't ask you to stop drinking. The most powerful addiction in the world that has destroyed so many lives and so many marriages, they don't say, you need to decide to stop. Why can't you just stop? Because doing it that way beats you up every single time. So what do they have to do? Admit that I'm powerless to do anything, right? I need a higher power. I have to surrender, not to my will, but thy will be done. Otherwise, I never get sober. Will I surrender? Cross-bearing is always uncomfortable. Looking at crosses, no big deal. Carrying one, really difficult. Looking at a cross says, hey, Jesus, I got a problem. Can you help me? Jesus, I'm feeling a little anxious. Can you give me some peace of mind? Hey, Jesus, I need some hope. I'm sad. Hey, Jesus, uh, work is hard. Could you get me a different boss? Once again, I'm asking Jesus to solve my problems. I'm asking him to make things better. Instead, I should wake up in the morning and say to Jesus, okay, you're going to lead. I'm going to follow. Whatever I have to do today, I'm going to follow you. Yes, I'm not feeling all that great, but I'm going to follow. I'm going into work where it's a little hostile and volatile, and I don't really respect or appreciate what's going on down, but I will follow. I'm going to let you be in control of my body and my mind and my spirit. Whatever I have today is yours. And if wearing a cross on a necklace or getting a tattoo that help, helps you out realize that, that, that that's not a lucky charm and, and that, that Jesus doesn't stay here on the, in the building, but he's with me all the time and I'm simply surrendering to his will every single moment, then very good. So do we need a cross in order for somebody to know that we're Christians? Absolutely not. They will know that we are Christians because we follow Jesus. We've surrendered to his authority and his lordship. And we express love in our community and sacrifice where we do. And people are more impressed with my, right, my act of kindness 
than my cross necklace or my 210 foot cross on our building. So let's live this out. It's not about a cross and a building. And think about this, for hundreds of years, nobody in the Christian community thought that the cross was a good idea. Hundreds of years. Why? Because it was a, a symbol of execution. Jesus died on that thing. It, nobody was thinking that night, it was like, hey, let's, uh, maybe, if we can get, maybe we can get that cross and we'll, we'll, we'll get some wood from it and sell it to stupid people, believing that that will help them with their life. For most of the time in the early Christian world, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the symbol of hope was communion, baptism, empty tomb stuff, right? Baptistry, right? Our baptistry is an empty tomb. But you're going to see that happen again today at this service at 930 here in our Omaha campus. I'm excited to be able to share with you today with that. It's a surrender moment. It's surrender. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the cross. Because, because it mattered. It made a big difference. Your willingness to get up on that and surrender yourself to that is amazing. I can't believe it that you endured that pain and suffering for me. And when I think about the cross and when I think about all that you've done for me, I words are just not enough. Forgive me when I have treated things and objects and stuff as as a lucky charm or powerful thing that I know you're not in that you're in me and greater is he who is within me than he who is within the world forgive me when I have crossed that line and now may we continue to embrace your grace and love as we sing together in Christ we pray amen